Um, for your own delectation, you can, if you want, read Psalms 5, 6 and 8. They are in the lectionary today. They, uh, and I wanted to offer a little ramble based largely from those Psalms, but actually, really, my agenda is I wanted to talk about expectation. I don't know if you've ever worked in business or, or management or sales. Um, or, uh, one of the things they talk about in that world is expectation management. Really, so, so that you kind of, either you under-promise and over-deliver, or you just make sure you avoid complaints because you say what it is people should expect out of what you're doing and what's going to happen. It's a very sensible way, I think, of kind of uh, uh, keeping people off your back. I I'm, I'm think one of the things we have a problem of and with it is our, our expectation of God and of life and of faith and of spirituality. So like last night we were uh, doing a study with uh, a few people um, and you had um, Jesus saying I I'm going to go and die and um, the Apostle Peter had, had this very kind of fixed perspective that really struggled, which kind of didn't engage with what Jesus said. Instead, Peter engaged with his own agenda uh, and, and, you know, took the cross and the resurrection, the Holy Spirit and years of life with Jesus for, I think, Peter's expectations of, of, of what life with God would be to, to change and to align, really, I suppose, with Jesus. And Jesus makes the very simple point, uh, I'm going to die and be resurrected. And he, then he says to people, you must take up your cross and follow me. Um, and yet Peter, probably like us, basically the underpinning agenda boils down to, but I want to be happy and comfortable and have lovely times. Um, Jesus does his best, I think, in the Gospels to do the expectation management. And I suspect it's a lifetime's work changing our expectation about spirituality, life and our experience of God. And, and this is why the Psalms become very helpful, because Psalm 6, 5, 6 and 8 kind of more or less catch the, the breadth of what it's really like and, and what we need to adjust to. So you, I mean, let me just skim through a few of them. So Psalm 5 starts, give ear to my words, O Lord, give heed to my sighing. So this psalmist is fed up of wicked people. But then he talks about bowing down towards God's holy temple in awe of you. So on one level, he's got kind of disappointment and despair in his prayer. And the other is that he's doing awe and reverence. And then he mentions in, in, in verse 11 about people who take refuge in God rejoicing. So here you've already got in one psalm a kind of despairing misery and awe of God and, and talking about rejoicing. But at the, under, the underpinning is, is just his angst about the society he's in. And then in <laughs> Psalm 6, where he lands... O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. So you've got this kind of character, fearful, uncertain, not, not knowing how to feel. He talks about his bones shaking with terror. Bear in mind, this is a worship song. This is a prayerful song. And, and, and he's, he's fearful of death. And he says, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. Now, this isn't the kind of what we expect out of prayer and worship, is it? But here we have it in the Psalms. And then we get to Psalm 8. And, and this is really a, a high worship song. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so his mind has shifted from this kind of despair and self-loathing and fear and moves to this. God is enthroned and the world is an amazing place. And I guess I'm simply pointing out that this is the life of faith. This is the following of God. This is 
what we should expect. And I suspect we need reminding of this, because mostly, if you're anything like me, what you want is peaceful and joyful and well, and the world to be right, and uh, God to be in his heavens, and God's creation to be functioning in line with that, and etc, etc. We all know that's not our experience. We all know that actually sometimes prayer is a grind, we can't stand the world, we don't much like ourselves, we also get joy, we love the world, and we think God's great. We got it all, don't we? So that's the actual experience. So that should be our expectation. So if you're feeling a bit rough today, or a bit joyful today, or a bit meh today, that's entirely normal. That's to be expected. So, so back to our expectation versus the reality. Why would God not simply fall into our lives and us be humming with the Holy Spirit. I mean, he does that at times, but it's not usual. Why do we not live like that all the time? Why would God leave us in this soup of our experience within which our prayers are a struggle? I don't profess to know the mind of God except for in snippets, but, but my guess is something like this that actually we are transformed through discipline that if we deliberately and deeply commit to following Jesus even when we're in a valley even when the shadow of death is upon us not just when the uplands are about the are with us when the beauty is with us it's it's my hunch that something happens to us and that faith and faithfulness become rooted in who we are rather than us simply like being a, a consumer of God related products. Uh, you know, where the whim for a nice time or a good holiday catches our attention and becomes what we do with our time. And it seems to be that when faith and faithfulness get rooted in that way, where we are following even in despair, even in boredom, even in when we're just feeling a bit meh, something happens. And I suspect the outcome is we become godly. We, we become righteous. Because instead of just being a person of appetite and need and desire, what we become is rooted. We become someone new. We become something better. And that, I think, is the outcome God's really after. Is that actually a transformed person who transforms the world is what we're called to be. Amen. For those of you who want to stay on for prayer, I'm going to keep it simple. You can reflect on Psalms 5, 6 and 8 in your own time. But I'm going to do a short litany from the uh, daily prayers. Maybe I'll be inspired to pray about particular things. And if not, then we'll keep it even simpler. That this day and all our days may be full of your praise. We pray to you, O Lord. That you will keep us this day without sin. We pray to you, O Lord, that we may walk before you in the paths of righteousness and peace. We pray to you, O Lord, that you will bless your people and lift them up forever. We pray to you, O Lord, that you will guide and protect us by your Holy Spirit and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. We pray to you, O Lord. And Lord God, we bring to you those times we're aching, resisting and resistant to the life we live. And we pray to you, O Lord, 
that you help us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Righto, services this week. I'll be over in Kimbolton doing Holy Communion, 10.30 on Wednesday. We've got uh, probably Jill and Pamela doing uploads on Thursday, Friday. Uh, and we're over at Barham for our Holy Communion service, uh, 10.30 or maybe 11, probably 10.30 on Sunday. God bless you all, um, and I'll see you soon. Cheers, now. Bye-bye.